Good morning, Bimblers. And you join me in Bursco. Full disclosure, we attempted this bimble last week in reverse. But when we got to Bursco, and we got to my final portage, my Coupe de Gras, which would have been Bursco Abbey, down Abbey Lane, by Abbey Brook, I found that it was actually in someone's back garden. And their back garden had 15 foot conifers all the way around it. So we couldn't actually see Bursco Abbey. So I got right to the end of the video and found that it was ruined. And I did think about releasing that video with the failure at the end, just to show that bimbles don't always go correctly. But then I thought about all the new bimblers and I thought about people finding the channel and I thought it would seem a little bit amateurish. I mean, it is amateurish. I am an amateur. But you know what I mean. So it was decided that we'd do it again. Only this time, we'd start in Bursco and it would be the road to Wigan Pier. So let's stop messing about. There's still something to see here in Bursco. So let's bimble. So our first portage here in Bursco is St John the Baptist Church and it's one of those commissioners churches or a Waterloo church or a million church which means that it was paid for by the government as part of the Church Building Act of 1818 and 1824 basically we'd just beat Napoleon at Waterloo and everyone was feeling very British and there was a great sense of national pride and the government decided to show off that national prize. They would build a load of churches for the regular folk in the country. Lots of people had moved and shifted about thanks to the Industrial Revolution and the building of lots of factories. And places like Bursco were now full of people working in mills. So they needed churches for them to go to on a Sunday. So the government gave funding to build a church here in Bursco and they actually gave them £3,040, which is around about £270,000 in today's money. That meant that the people of Bursco had to raise an extra £400 so the church could be built. So it's worth about £300,000 in today's money. It was completed in 1829 by a Liverpool architect by the name of Daniel Stewart. And the odd thing about him is he only built one other church. There's no records of him building anything else. He built St John the Baptist Church here in Bursco and St Matthias Church in Liverpool, which has now been knocked down. But taking into consideration that he only built two churches, he did a good job here with St John the Baptist Church. Just up my street, a little bit odd. No windows at the front. Not really Gothic styled. A little bit more like a town hall. But with a bit of Gothic mixed in. I like it. Let's bimble. You talk, you talk, all your thoughts on your mind. Are you listening? You still won't figure it out. Figure it. You throw your thoughts on your mind all the time. Oh, it's deafening. You still won't figure it out. Today we're using the Leeds Liverpool Canal as our little motorway to get us into Wigan without having to deal with any traffic or any hills. That's the beauty of the canal. There's no hills and there's no traffic. We could have equally gone in the opposite direction 
rode about 30 miles and ended up in the centre of Liverpool. Or we could just carry on from Wigan and go to Blackburn and Skipton and eventually Leeds. Hence the name, the Leeds Liverpool Canal. But this little bit that we're on right now is something called the Rufford Branch, which branches off the Leeds Liverpool Canal and goes off towards Preston. It makes up something called the Ribble Link these days, which is a way to get your canal boat from the Leeds Liverpool Canal onto the Lancaster Canal via the River Ribble. This section was dug in 1781, seven years after they finished off the Leeds Liverpool Canal, and it links Bursco to Solemn. And it also links onto something called the Douglas Navigation, which we'll talk about in a bit. The final section of the Rufford Branch links Solemn to a place called Tarleton, which we'll have to bimble to. They've got a heritage railway there that you can ride on. It was dug in 1805 and it was dug as part of the Croston drainage improvements. Lest we forget, this part of England used to be England's largest lake, Martin Mayer, and they drained off the lake to turn it into farmland. We'll have to have a bimble right down the Rufford branch one of these days, starting in Bursco again, and have a go on that railway. Anyway, let's bimble. Why won't you figure it out? Figure it. You know I talk really loud. If you heard, oh, it's deafening. You still won't figure it out. Figure it. But with a simple frame of mind and a little time. Protest all you like We both know With good will on your side In a little time You can have just what you like We both know It's easy if you just try better off this time Well, Bimblers, we reach par bold. Full disclosure again. The last attempt at this bimble, going in the opposite direction, we didn't stop at par bold. I spent ages trying to find out interesting things about par bold, and I couldn't find anything at the time. And as soon as I went riding my bike through it, I realised it had an 18th century windmill in it. 
Someone should put that on the Wikipedia page. In fact, I might have to do that, might not It was built in 1794 and it replaced a water mill on the River Douglas. More about the River Douglas later on and the Douglas Navigation. But it was the building of the Douglas Navigation that probably prompted them to build a windmill. It probably wrecked the water flow in the River Douglas and they couldn't get the power up to grind the flour. By all accounts, they had two stones from the Peak District to grind coarse flour and two stones from France to grind fine flour. Apparently that's the best stone to use. And it was in an ideal location here next to the Leeds-Liverpool Canal. It meant that they could get grain in from Liverpool, which meant they could get grain in from the USA. They wouldn't have to use local grain from local farmers. They could buy it cheaper from America. In 1817, it was bought by two brothers named Hugh and Richard and their company, H&R Ains Co. We spoke about the Ains Co mill in Bursco in a previous bimble, our National Cycle Route 62 bimble, 2.5. More of those coming in the future. The mill over in Bursco was a steam-powered mill. They needed to produce more and more flour, so the power of the wind wasn't quite cutting it. So they used a steam engine to mill the flour. They built that steam-powered flour mill in 1850, but by 1951, 101 years later, it was derelict, along with the windmill behind me. And they stayed that way up until the 90s. Eventually, Greenall's Brewery bought the windmill behind me because they owned the pub next door, also called the windmill. The flour mill here in Parbold is now a picture framing shop and an art gallery. But that's not the only thing that's here in Parbold. I spied off in the distance a rather tall church spire. That's a Catholic church built by Edmund Kirby. We've been going on about him quite a lot just recently. But we've not got time to go over there. We've got a bimble to Apley Bridge.
Well Bimblers, as I previously said, we're on our way to Wigan Pier, which is a rather fanciful idea. But an equally fanciful sounding idea was that we were on our way to a set of waterfalls in Wigan. But here we are, Fairy Glen. It's a succession of waterfalls and a succession of cliffs on the Sprodley Brook. It's rather nice to look at. It's up a big hill. I'm sweating cobs getting up there, but it was worth it. It's even worth it that this is our second attempt to come here because over the last week it's rained a bit so the waterfall is actually a lot more impressive today. It all lies to the north of Apley Bridge and Apley Bridge gets its name from three words Apple, the fruit, Lee being the Old English word for woodland and bridge meaning a bridge over the River Douglas apparently. The bridge bit was only added in the 1200s according to church records at Cocker Sand Abbey in Lancaster. We've been there in the past. Before then, it was known as Apley Moor, or just simply Apley. And it was in the parish of Eccleston, another place that we've been to. It was Henry VIII that knackered Cocker Sand Abbey, as we found out in that bimble. But he wasn't the only tyrant in history to be knackering up the priories and abbeys and churches. Oliver Cromwell had a go at that as well. Oliver Cromwell destroyed Bursco Abbey, which was what we were supposed to go to in Bursco, but we failed. Apparently one of the monks from that abbey was hightailing it out of there. Not only did Oliver Cromwell order his men to knacker the abbey's priories and churches, but he ordered them to murder all the monks as well. And the monk didn't seem too keen on that. He made it to Apley Bridge, and he hid in a cottage there, inside the chimney. When Oliver Cromwell's men found him, they lit a fire in the chimney underneath him and obviously he got down. But Oliver Cromwell's men killed him anyway. They placed his skull on the mantelpiece of that cottage and that's where it stayed from then on out, apart from a few unfortunate times where it was removed and apparently the people that moved it met with their comeuppance. There's one tale of someone who moved into the cottage who wasn't too keen on there being a skull on his mantelpiece and he threw the skull into the River Douglas. But the skull made its way back, upstream, back to the house. And that same fellow, by all accounts, drowned in the River Douglas a few months later. So from then on out, they kept the skull on the mantelpiece and they named the cottage Skull House Cottage, as well as the road leading up to it, Skull House Lane. There are many tales of people having mishaps due to removing the skull. But in more recent times, some studies were done to the skull and they found that it was actually a female skull. It was a woman. And I don't know whether you know this, but monks are men. So it probably wasn't a monk skull in the end anyway, but a woman's skull. God knows where they got that from. But it's a nice tale, isn't it? But I've got some tales to tell you about the River Douglas. So let's bimble. To light from the dark Broke out in shimmering waves To my heart CP and Tim but the same Familiar in simplified ways Broke down the lily white scars To my heart As if this was love that I felt Falling for somebody else Taking my eyes from the ground Turning my heart upside down As if this could change all the past Fixing the bruise from the last And so we reach Gathurst Viaduct Which is where the M6 motorway Passes over the Leeds-Liverpool Canal But before then It was where the Leeds-Liverpool Canal Met with the River Douglas And the Douglas Navigation it was another one of those Acts of Parliaments passed in 1720. There's loads of them. There was the Mersey and Irwell Navigation Act of 1720. That said that you could do whatever you wanted to the River Mersey and the River Irwell. As long as it made things go in and out of Manchester. From that you've got Howley Weir, which makes the River Mersey non-tidal from Howley upwards. 
and it also means that the River Irwell is non-tidal. Also from that, you get the Runcorn Latchford Canal, aka the Black Bear Canal, aka the Old Key Canal, aka the artist formerly known as Canal. And eventually, in 1894, you get the Manchester Ship Canal, all from the same Act of Parliament. You get the River Weaver Navigation Act of 1720. That's exactly the same thing, but with the River Weaver. That's how they got all the salt out of Northwich, into the Mersey, into the port of Liverpool. Here in Wigan, they didn't have a way to get all that coal that they dug out of the ground. The cannel coal, the candle coal, the highly prized coal with minimal dust that burned so cleanly and was so highly prized. You had to take it by pack horse, or you had to try and get it down the River Douglas as it was, which was tidal and not suitable in places. But even though the Act was passed in 1720, the Douglas navigation didn't open until 1742. That was because someone was cooking the books, skimming off the top, putting it in the back pocket. It was a Thomas Steers, a William Squire and his brother-in-law, Richard Norris, that came up with the idea for the Douglas navigation. And money was raised from shareholders, but the money went missing. And those three fellas ended up in court. Thomas Steers showed evidence that he bought timber and stone to build locks, but William Squires evidently didn't have any evidence and he absconded and he was never seen again. The trial took five years, from 1729 until 1734. In 1774, they built the Leeds-Liverpool Canal, which sealed the fate of the Douglas navigation. The Douglas navigation would have took the coal from Wigan down the River Douglas out into the River Ribble near Preston. But at the time, the River Ribble was quite treacherous and split off into many different paths. So it made much more sense going down the Leeds-Liverpool Canal, all flat and lovely and lovely locks, into Liverpool. I mean, it's a lovely bike ride. We'll have to do it one day. In fact, we'll have to do a bike ride down the whole of the Leeds-Liverpool Canal, why not? You can still see bits of locks in the River Douglas and you can walk down some of it. In fact, in one of our National Cycle Route 62 bimbles, we ended our bimble at the River Douglas and spoke about this very topic. But there's more industrial past there in Wigan involving the Leeds-Liverpool Canal. There's something called Wigan Pier. Let's go and get an ice cream, shall we? This was love that I felt Falling for somebody else Taking my eyes from the ground Turning my heart upside down As if this could change all the past Fixing the bruise from the last Time that I felt anything As if this was love that I felt As if this was somebody else That I felt falling for somebody else, taking my eyes from the ground, turning my heart upside down, as if this could change all the past, fixing the bruise from the last time that I felt anything, as if this was love that I felt, as if this was somebody else. Well, bimblers, I seem to have become part of a gang of shirtless youths on that last bimble. But what you don't know is that behind the camera, I had my shirt off as well. And I always ride everywhere, no hands. Honest. Anyway, one of the first things you think about when you think about Wigan is the pie. The Wigan kebab. That's a pie on a balm cake, or a bread cake if you're from Yorkshire. 
or a bap if you're from down south or a muffin if you're a pervert the second thing you think about is something called Wigan Pier which doesn't really exist not in the way that we think about piers it wasn't a pier like Southport or the ones at Blackpool it was just a coal jetty that used to load the coal from the local collieries that canal coal onto the boats of the Leeds Liverpool Canal the joke is thought to originate from the 1890s when a group of holiday makers on their way to Southport broke down just outside of Wigan Wallgate and the people on the train were heard to remark oh look there's Wigan Pier as a joke that joke was perpetuated by George Formby's dad George Formby Senior he used to joke about it in a lot of his shows and when he played in Wigan he used to remark that on his way to the venue the tide was in referring to all the Wigan flashes it wasn't just George Formby Senior that used to joke about it either George Formby Junior the George Formby that we know you know when I'm cleaning windows that one he sung about Wigan Pier in one of his songs the Wigan Boat Express which is a innuendo lace jaunt typical of George Formby it's rather enjoyable in 1937 George Orwell wrote his book The Road to Wigan Pier which is a book about the hardships of the working class in the UK at the time and the squalid living conditions it's not like that nowadays it's a nice place to go and ride your bike Wigan's a lovely place to visit lots of interesting things to see if you're a nerd like me it might be thought that George Orwell didn't like Wigan but it was reported that he remarked he liked Wigan the people just not the scenery he was also reported to be disappointed that Wigan Pier had gone that old jetty was sold off for scrap and what I'm sat on right now is a replica so if I was hoping to get an ice cream at Wigan Pier I think I'll be disappointed I'll have to pop to the co-op and get a Cornetto instead <laughs>